Hi folks, good to be with you. And we're looking at uh, the Trinity. We're looking at this book. Don't forget jasonbestpreacher.com. Uh, L. Raymond, New Systematic Theology. Uh, and we're looking at the Trinity. And we've got so much material uh, to look at. So, so now we're going to look at Jesus' self testimony to his deity. deity. Jesus' self testimony to his deity. Page 214. A truly vast literature has grown up around the Son of Man title in the Gospels, and only a brief discussion can be given here. The title itself uh, itself uh, Ho Huois Tau Anthropo uh, Anthropos only in John 527, but this Anomaly is, is accounted for by Colwell's rule. It occurs 60 times in the synoptics appearing in all four of the alleged earlier documentary source uh, brackets Er, Marcus, Q, M and L. And 13 times in the fourth gospel for a total of 82 occurrences in the gospels. The Son of Man sayings themselves depict the Son of Man figure in three distinct situations that is for his current ministry, that of his suffering in the hands of men, maltreated, betrayed and executed and buried, and that of his rising and appearing in glory on the clouds of heaven. Who is this son of man? Or are these situations so desperate that we must more accurately speak of more than one son of man? Assuming the authenticity of these sayings as contained in the Episma Vox Jesus, the church has traditionally understood the phrase Son of Man as the title Jesus chose as self-designation precisely because although assuredly messianic, Daniel 7.13, the title was ambiguous in meaning to the current popular imagination. This enabled him to claim to be the Messiah with little danger of the current erroneous views being read into it before he had the opportunity to infuse it with the full orbed content of the messianic task which was foreshadowed in the prediction of the Old Testament. Furthermore, according to the church, traditional understanding of Jesus spelled out his messianic task as the Son of Man precisely in terms of the three situations of serving, suffering and glory applied these situations to himself, the former two being fulfilled in connection with his first advent, the last two fulfilled first in the lesser typical comment in judgment. The destruction of Jerusalem AD 70 to which most probably Matthew 10 23 and Matthew 24 27 30 perhaps others refer and second in his grand and final apocalyptic revelation in an eschatological glory. That the church was correct when it understood the title as a self designation of Jesus when it applied these situations of the son of man to Jesus is evident from the following four lines. When Matthew reads, on account of me, Luke in 6.22 reads, for the sake of the Son of Man. When Matthew in 10.32 has I, Luke 12 says, has the Son of Man. When Mark 8.27 and Luke 9.18 have I, Matthew 16.3 reads the Son of Man. But when Mark 8.31, 8.38 and Luke 9.22 and 9.26 have the Son of Man, Matthew 16.21 and 10.33 corresponds, reads, he and I, clearly the title at least times was simply a paraphrase for I or me, demonstrated that Jesus intended himself as its referent and always standing in the background was the eschatological figure of Daniel 7. When Jesus kissed Judas according to Luke 22:24, see also Matthew 26, 23 and 24 and verse 48, Jesus asked Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? 
Uh, as Royce J. Grunler argues, quote, Grun Grunler, uh, son of man, evangelical, evangelical dictionary of theology, Grand Rapids, Baker, 1984, uh, 1035 to 1036. Dot, uh, a. Royce J. Grunle says, Ma Matthew 19.28 is specifically instructive on the matter who the glorified Son of Man is. For Jesus promised his disciples the authority of truly I say unto you, that in the new world, when the Son of Man shall sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Surely Jesus, whom they have followed, in terms of whom they shall reign, will not be excluded from reigning with them, and there then be two enthroned central figures. The sense of the passage exegetically would imply that only one central person is assumed, namely the Son of Man. He writes, It is likely that non-supernaturalist assumptions lie behind the refusal to allow these sayings which portray the Son of Man as a glorified divine being are Jesus' own prophetic vision of his vindication and glorification in the coming judgment. Certainly there is no suggesting elsewhere in the Gospels that he attempted any other figure to appear after him. In fact, among the Mark and sayings, Uh, 9 verse 9 chapter 9 verse 9 Matthew 17 9 Mark 8 31 Luke 9 22 Luke 24 7 Mark 9 31 Matthew 17 verse 22 23 Mark chapter 10 verse 33 34 Matthew chapter 20 verse 18 and 19 Luke 18 verse 31 33 clearly refers to his own rising as the son of man from the dead and Matthew Mark 14 62 the scene before the high priest couples his I am confession that he is the Christ, the son of the blessed, and the surrogate for I, the son of man, sitting at the right hand power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So, end of quote. When Jesus asked the man born blind, whom he has just healed, do you believe the son of man? The man asked, who is he, Lord? Tell me that I may believe him. Jesus replied, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you, John 9, 35-37. Thus it is clear that all four evangelists intend their readers to understand that Jesus is the Son of Man in the roles both of suffering servant, who came to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19, 10, and who also came not to be served but to serve, to give his life as ransom of many, Mark 10, 45, Matthew 20, 28. And have come in judgment, judge an eschatological king. As for his background, both evangelical and the growing critical consensus is that Daniel 7 13 14 is the primary source. A common objection that is raised against Daniel's man like figure being made the source of Jesus, the Son of Man, sayings is the large absence of the motif of suffering and the description of this figure in Daniel 7. While the idea of suffering is often attached to the title in Jesus' usage, this problem has been uh, adequately answered by evangelical New Testament scholarship. When Jesus employed the title, he was self-consciously claiming to be Daniel, son of man, and hence the Messiah, uniting with him the Old Testament figure both of motif of suffering, the work of the Messiah's suffering servant, and the motif of his apocalyptic coming to judge the earth and to bring the kingdom of God to its consummation. Commentating upon the significance of the Son of Man title, Gerardus Voss writes, A close adherence to the spirit of the scene in Daniel, from which it was taken, it suggests a messianic career in which all of a sudden, without human interference or military conflict, through an immediate act of God, the highest dignity and power are conferred. The kingship here portrayed is not only supernatural, it is transcendental. Even a cursory ex examination of Jesus, Son of Man's sayings will bear out all that Voss asserts here and more. For example, this title in the fourth gospel connotates the heavenly superhuman side of Jesus' mysterious existence 
expressing what is commonly called his pre-existence. John 3.13, John 6.62 As the Son of Man, Jesus, in the synoptics, claimed to have authority to forgive sins. Matthew 9.6, Mark 2.10, Luke 5.24 And to regulate even the observance of divine ordinance of the Sabbath. Matthew 12.8, Mark 2.28, Luke 6.5 Clearly, prerogatives, prerogatives of divinity, div deity alone. To speak against the Son of Man, he said, although forgivable, is blasphemy. Matthew twelve thirty two, as the Son of Man, the angels are his. Matthew thirteen forty one, implying therefore thereby his own super angelic status and lordship over them. As the Son of Man, he would know a period of humiliation, having no place to lay his head. Matthew eight twenty. Luke 9:58, and finally, I, even dying a cruel death of crucifixion, but he, the Son of Man, would suffer and die. He declared only to the end that he might ransom others. Matthew 28 and Mark 10:45. A man's eternal destiny would turn on his relationship to the Son of Man. He taught, for unless the Son of Man gives a man's life, there is no life in him. John 6:53. As the Son of Man. He would rise from the dead and sit at the right hand power and come in the clouds with glory and power, power and glory. Matthew 24, 30, Mark 13, 25, Luke 21, 27. Coming with his only, his only angels and the glory of his Father, true enough. Matthew 16, 27, Mark 8, 38. But coming in his own glory as well, Matthew 25, 31. When he comes, he declares he will come with authority to execute judgment upon all men Precisely because he is the Son of Man, John 5.27. Clearly the Son of Man's sayings embodied Jesus' conception of Messiahship and its association were supernatural, even divine, in character. Warfield does not overstate the matter when he writes. It is in the picture which Jesus himself draws of us, of the Son of Man, that we see his superhuman nature portrayed. For the figure thus brought before us distinctly a super one, one which is not only in the future to be sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven, but which is the present world itself exercise functions which are truly divine, for the Lord is Lord of the Sabbath, but the God who instituted it commemoration of his own rest, and who can forgive sins but God only, and the assignment to the Son of Man are the function of judge of the world, and the ascription to him of the right to forgive sins, in each case, but another way of saying that he is the divine person, for these are divine acts. So that's looking at the word Son of Man in relation to the Trinity. The word Son of Man in relation to the Trinity. So I don't think we're going to be able to look at all the information about the Trinity, about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit etc. But we're just getting to uh, the detail of some intricate bits. So it's good to be with you. God bless you and love to everybody.